If you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, you're certainly not alone. About 70% of Americans will have a diagnosis of high blood pressure within their lifetime. And one in three U.S. adults, or about 68 million people, currently have a diagnosis of high blood pressure. And that's costing the healthcare system roughly $48 billion per year. So this is a pretty big ticket. The question is, of course, is this a warranted diagnosis? Do you really have high blood pressure? And if so, if you fall in the category of people that, you know, legit have a higher blood pressure, does it need to be treated with medication? So we're going to talk about that. At the end of the video, I'm going to give you six strategies how you can lower your blood pressure naturally, which I always think should be the first thing to try before jumping to medication. So the first issue is in terms of determining if you have high blood pressure or not, what criteria do we go by? And there are discrepancies. It varies from country to country, but even within our country in the US, there are you know different beliefs of what constitutes high blood pressure truly, right? If you follow the American Academy of Family Physicians, for example, they say anything above 140 over 90, which is what I learned in medical school, is considered high blood pressure. And then we might evaluate if you would benefit from a medication or if we can naturally lower it, right? But the American Heart Association is a bit more aggressive and that really came up over the last years mostly. And they're saying, no, it's 120 over 80. That's, a, you know, of course, a much lower margin to reach. And for many people that fall, you know, slightly higher than that, they might end up on blood pressure medication without truly, in my opinion, qualifying for a diagnosis of high blood pressure. And why is that a big deal? Well, any medication you're taking, you know, even if it's something, oh, this is just a beta blocker, or this is just a diuretic, every medication will have potential side effects. Medications will have cost. And, you know, if you don't need to take it, by all means, avoid them, right? Which is not saying that nobody needs blood pressure medication. There are people that greatly benefit from blood pressure medication to keep them healthy long term, because normalizing a very high blood pressure can in fact you know uh, protect your heart compact uh, actually protect your entire cardiovascular system your arteries and everything as well as your organs so we have to see that some people absolutely need those medications but in my opinion it is very much over prescribed and that of course is in the interest of the pharma industry because you know they want to sell their products and there are many blood pressure medications because we can attack blood pressure from many different angles you know from a beta blocker to an angiotensin blocker to we can go with a diuretic there's many different strategies on how to lower blood pressure and there's many medications and a lot of money to be made obviously so anyway if we're saying that you know um somebody has a blood pressure of 100 and 30 over 85, according to the American Heart Association, they would qualify to high blood pressure and they might end up on a medication, right? So one is that we have different parameters and keep that in mind. And you should always ask your doctor if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, what is your parameter? What's your cutoff? What organization do you go by? Okay. And there are certain biases here as well. And I'm going to talk about that in, in another video, but the American Heart Association has some, some ties to some industries, to in, industries that, you know, again, make, I think their recommendation a bit questionable in my opinion. Now, um, first of all, if you just have once in a while a slightly elevated blood pressure in certain situations, that does not qualify you to have a high blood pressure. And how was it established that you have or that you qualify to have hypertension or high blood pressure? Usually it goes like this. You go to your doctor's office. They check your blood pressure. It's high. They ask you to come back. It's high again. You end up on a medication, right? However, many mistakes can be made along those lines. So you got to ask yourself, well, under what circumstances was my blood pressure taken? And many times mistakes are made. And it's not that the doctor doesn't know any better. Of course, they know how to take a blood pressure appropriately, but they're rushed. You know, um, the clinic is busy. The nurse will rush you in. You know, they take your blood pressure right away in an uncomfortable position. And you may not have a chance to go to the bathroom and, you know, you have to pee and didn't have a chance to do that. All these factors influence your blood pressure, right? So the proper way to do it really, which is very important, is that, you know, you are put in a room for about five to 10 minutes where it's calm and quiet. It's normal room temperature, so it's not too hot, not too cold. Uh, and that's actually because you know, either way it can influence your blood pressure, unfortunately, right? So you should be relaxed. You shouldn't be nervous. If you have something called white coat hypertension, where you see a doctor or a nurse and your blood pressure goes up, you got to tell them that, right? In that situation, maybe it's better if you take your blood pressure at home in a comfortable environment with your own blood pressure cuff, which is something I actually would always recommend. And especially if you've been, uh, if you had a reading that's high in the office, Make the investment, get yourself a, an automatic blood pressure cuff from Amazon. It's not very expensive and check it on your own in a calm situation because that gives you a better idea of where your pressure really is outside of any factors that can influence it negatively, right? 
so calm in so in this room quiet you know uh, not too hot not too cold you shouldn't cross your legs when you do your blood pressure reading so feet uh, planted firm on on the floor your arm should be at about the level of your heart that's important as well when you take your blood pressure make sure you didn't drink coffee right before that can certainly elevate your blood pressure make sure you didn't just come from a workout because of course that elevates your blood pressure as well which is a natural response to working out and it takes a bit of time after your workout for that blood pressure to normalize again so all these things you have to keep in mind right and then, of course, you want to make sure that the cuff they put on you fits your arm. You know, if you're a larger person and they put a small cuff on you, that can artificially elevate your blood pressure. Another thing is a lot of times they're rushing. You have a tight shirt. You can't really roll it up. So they put the cuff over your shirt. And that's a big mistake as well. That also will increase your blood pressure artificially. So make sure that, you know, when you go in to have a blood pressure reading, that you either have a, a short T-shirt or something that's short sleeved or something you can roll up or something you can take off. That's actually very important. So it's got to be done under the right circumstances. And then, you know, if all these parameters were followed, then we can get a true reading. Uh, and if that is elevated, then, you know, that's not sufficient. A one-time elevated blood pressure in the office doesn't count. Well, it counts, but it doesn't really uh, count to uh, uh, give you the diagnosis of high blood pressure. So then you come back at least a day, ideally a few days later, and they repeat the whole process under the same circumstances, which is very important. And so it's important that you really remember, hey, how was my blood pressure taken? How did I end up with these high values? Now, if you have a high value, again, I would recommend get yourself an automatic blood pressure cuff from Amazon. They're very cheap, right? And measure it at home, following exactly what I just outlined under the same circumstances and see what your pressure is there, right? And that gives you a better idea. I would measure it also at different times in the day, and then you could also see, well, how much, for example, does coffee influence you? So if you take it right after a coffee, you'll see that it'll, it'll go up or after exercise. These are the important things to understand about your own blood pressure, right? So anyway, so if it's done appropriately, then the question is, let's say you fall into a category and let's say you are 145 or 150 over 95. So even if you go by the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, uh, set uh, of uh, uh, qualifying parameters here, you have high blood pressure, fine. Now the question is then, should be treated with the medication or not. And usually, and this is what I learned in medical school was, no, first you do lifestyle modification, lifestyle changes in order to see if we can naturally decrease your blood pressure, right? And there are many things that, that we can do. Another thing, of course, if your blood pressure is really very high and you might have some other conditions, then your doctor has to investigate are there underlying causes for this blood pressure? Because what happens usually if your blood pressure is slightly elevated, um, you know, that is a lot of times or 90% of the time is something we call essential hypertension. It just means we don't know the cause of it. You know, it could be normal aging, slight hardening of your arteries. We don't know for sure. Uh, could be that you've gained some weight. So, you know, weight gain, all these things can influence this. But there's about 10% of cases where, where there's a secondary cause and that needs to be, you know, uh, uh, understood then and your doctor should investigate, of course. Usually, though, you would present with really odd, very high blood pressure or something that doesn't seem right, and then your doctor should investigate. What are some of the causes of secondary hypertension? So remember, this is only about 10% of cases. Most people do not fall under this category. But it could be something like um, sleep apnea. So someone, you know, um, at night, they stop breathing, actually. They're snoring, and all of a sudden, it's quiet, and that means they stop breathing. That can be for, like, you know, many seconds, sometimes half a minute, and then they start breathing again, right? But this really raises blood pressure, and it's very dangerous. It's weight related, so weight loss can help here. Sometimes people get like a CPAP machine to help them breathe, right? but this is something that is a secondary cause, of course, right? Renal artery stenosis, very rare, happens sometimes. Kidney disease, of course, you know. Other secondary causes can be endocrine disorders like Cushing's disease or an overactive thyroid. But there's, there's more, but again, this is something that your doctor would investigate. Many of these will show up on blood tests that are being done routinely, and then people, you know, then your primary care doctor can investigate if that's the cause. Most of the time, again, primary hypertension, we don't know why, it's just elevated. And then again, it used to be that we do these lifestyle changes, but more and more, you know, doctors don't have time and they just write you the script because they're saying, you know what, I'm not going to sit there and, you know, talk to someone for a long time. They're probably not going to listen to me anyway. And here's, here's your medication. Well, that shouldn't happen this way. You should first be instructed to see, hey, why don't we do a few changes and see if this helps and you come back in about a month and we see if your pressure is under better control. Now, most clinics don't do that, but that's also certainly something that you can discuss with your physician because ultimately you're the person making the decisions about your health. It's your doctor's advising you, but it's your decision, right? So when we think about it, what are some of the strategies that you can use? I'm going to give you six strategies where you can really um, influence your blood pressure in, in a very profound way 
that might be sufficient to get you to a normal blood pressure. And I certainly would uh, recommend to follow all of those to get the best effect, right? Number one, weight loss. So if you are even slightly overweight or if you have too much of a body fat percentage, your blood pressure will go up, right? That's normal and that's part of aging. If we control that, if we are able to lose body fat, if we're getting slimmer, blood pressure comes down. It's very uh, works very well. If you're smoking, of course, stop smoking. That's a very easy one to uh, really see that, you know, um, smoking elevates blood pressure. You, you got to stop that. I wouldn't minimize that. I would just stop it completely. Drinking alcohol. Now, I drink about a couple of drinks a week. I used to drink more. I did a video about it. I think it's important to minimize your alcohol consumption, especially if you have high blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure and you have about two, three drinks, you know, a day, then I would certainly cut that back. I would stick with about one to two drinks per week. That's my recommendation. Ideally, no drinks, right? But if you can limit it to that, I think that's sufficient to impact your blood pressure significantly, right? Exercising. And I mean real exercise and really regularly, at least four times a week, you know? We're talking about at least 30 minutes to an hour intense weightlifting. You can alter that with some aerobic exercise. Personally, what I usually do four days a week, I do weight training. And then on the other three days, I do at least about a half an hour on the, on the stepper, you know? So I do some cardio, so to speak, just about half an hour. So that's not a whole lot, but this works out for me. I do this in the morning. I usually um, try to get my exercise out uh, out of the way early in the morning. And that's something that uh, is really helpful, but it has to be regularly. So you got to get yourself, push yourself, exercise, tremendous impact on your blood pressure, I can promise you. So that makes a big difference. Also helps with your weight loss, obviously, right? If you have to do so. Um, meditation, that's an interesting one. There are several studies that were published on transcendental meditation and the impact on systolic blood pressure, you know, and it's really amazing how we can impact blood pressure by finding time to relax. And usually this goes by really finding about five to 10 minutes a day after you know how to do it, where you in a quiet space, it's dark, you know, usually lying down and you, you're successively relaxing all the muscles in your body, you know, and you have breathing techniques while you do this. And this is tremendous. Great for stress relief, which is another reason for high blood pressure. And it's hugely helpful. And again, studies have shown that you can significantly impact your blood pressure that way, right? Good sleep, that's uh, number five. And that's something that is uh, something that most people overlook. I recommend between seven to nine hours at night. Nine hours, I don't know who can get that. I mean, I certainly can. I get about seven hours every night. But if you get less than that, if you get only five hours per night, it can certainly impact your, your, your blood pressure. It can also impact your hormone levels uh, negatively, for example, testosterone, right? So it's important to get good sleep. Um, one thing is maybe turn off that uh, device or your, your cell phone or your computer earlier on, right? Read at night maybe a book and have lights that are more like red light, not not blue light, you know, like a, at, at a low angle, maybe like a, a fireplace or something like that, or a candle by, uh, by which you read. That'll be very helpful, right? These things are helping with your sleep. And then also, of course, don't drink alcohol before bedtime because you will fall asleep faster, but your sleep will be disrupted, right? And then uh, coffee. Now, limiting coffee, I would say I drink coffee every morning. But uh, in a lot of people, what I see is when they drink coffee after midday, that's when it becomes problematic. So maybe limit, co limit coffee to the early part of the day. That already is very helpful, right? So these are six of the strategies that I would implement. One more that's talked about that I don't agree with is limiting sodium. And there was a study recently done in 2023 in JAMA, which again showed that if you are extremely limiting salt compared to a group that has a high salt intake, you can impact your blood pressure. In this case, it was something like eight millimeter mercury. However, when you look at these studies, I think they're unrealistic. So here, the, the group that actually got the low sodium diet, they were on 500 milligrams of salt a day. That is extremely low. I say if you stay below three grams a day, you're pretty good, you know, 3,000 milligrams. Americans, on average, take in 4,000 to 6,000 milligrams a day, which is way too high, of course, right? A lot of this comes from processed foods and junk foods. I and mean, you should cut those out anyway to optimize your weight and be healthier, and that already impacts your blood pressure. But taking only 500 milligrams of sodium in a day, I think is difficult. I also don't know long-term if that's really a healthy strategy. We do need salt, actually. And I think that's very low. And then, of course, in the control group here, they gave them the high salt group. They gave them an extra 2,200 milligrams of salt on top of their regular diet. So, yes, if you have these extreme discrepancies, you can impact blood pressure. I don't know how achievable this is for the normal person. That's why I did not list that in one of the strategies. If you want to, you can try decreasing your sodium. In my opinion, again, if you're under 3,000 to 2,500 milligrams of salt a day, you're doing pretty good. 
So following this, I think your blood pressure should look a lot better. I would implement all these strategies. Talk to your primary care doctor, come up together with a plan on how to do this, but be proactive. Because if you're not proactive, you're just going to get put on a medication. That's how this works today. And if you're proactive, you know, you can really impact your own health. And especially when it comes to blood pressure, I think there are millions of people in this country that are taking blood pressure medication without truly needing it. And if you follow those six strategies that I gave you, not only will your blood pressure come down, you'll also be healthier for, you know, preventing other diseases, including cancer, autoimmune disorder, uh, diabetes, and so on. So we have a lot of benefits here by being healthier. Try this first, talk to your doctor, and hopefully you will not need that medication.